what do you read? So what's your favorite uh, type of uh, books? Uh, yeah, so, um, well, I like, you know, I like Agatha Christie, I like uh, P.D. James, um, so those English mysteries, both the more traditional ones and the more police procedural kind of mysteries, for fun, anyway. Great, uh, Dr. Kunz, thank you. Um, again, welcome, we are so happy that you're here. Uh, you, 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 know, you have the mic, the floor is yours. Okay, great, great. Well, thank, thank you, Yanku, and thank you for the opportunity, and thanks everyone for, for, for showing up, and uh, I hope, uh, you know, it's sort of a new experience for a lot of us, uh, this for me. And uh, yeah, Yanku asked me to talk about uh, suffering. So I do, uh, I do a course uh, every couple of years on uh, philosophy and Christianity, and so this is one of the issues that we deal with. So I'm gonna sort of run through real quickly some of the content that I cover in that, in that section of that course. And I've got it down to uh, nine questions about, uh, about why God allows suffering. And uh, also that'll get us into questions about how we can make, uh, how we can find meaning uh, in suffering as well, and what, how we can sort of make sense of suffering in our own lives and that of others. So the first question, sort of a simple question is, why didn't God create a world just full of happiness and devoid of pain? He's all powerful. Uh, he could have created a world where there was just happiness and no trouble, no pain at all. So why, um, why didn't he do that? And um, the simple question for that is that uh, it really, I think, has the wrong conception of what God is aiming at, what God is attempting to do with, with creation. Uh, it assumes that God is aiming at a certain kind of global outcome. That is, his goal was to make a world of a certain kind, a world of a certain kind, a world with lots of happiness and no pain. And um, in other words, it's assuming that God is, to put it in very philosophical terms, a utility maximizer. That is, what God really was about was how to make as much happiness as possible. And you and I are just kind of secondary in that, on that picture. We're just containers into which God could stuff as much happiness as possible. That's, that's the kind of picture. But the, um, the picture that we get from Christian theology and from the Bible is that God is a God of love. The word Greek word is agape, which means that God cares about individuals, not about aggregate quantities. So he isn't trying to make the most happiness possible. He's rather trying to love particular individuals, right? Not just as parts of the whole. So the question really, the question is framing, is framing things wrong. Uh, the point of God's creation was not to create a world of a certain kind, but rather to, to uh, express and manifest his love. Now that would then lead to a second natural question, which is, okay, let's say that God is interested in individuals, not in the totality, so to speak. Still, why couldn't he intervene to prevent the suffering of individual creatures that, he's, that he loves? So if he loves me and he loves you as individuals, why couldn't he intervene to prevent our suffering if he truly loves us? Why does he stand, stand back and do nothing in so many cases? And the answer here, I think, is that God was committed to creating a certain kind of world, creating and sustaining a certain world. And that world has to have creatures in it that have their own natures both animate and inanimate. So he created human beings with, with human natures and gave us, gave us free will so that we're free to, uh, to do things, to love each other and also to hate each other, to, to uh, help each other and sometimes to harm each other. But he also created an inanimate world which has, which has its own nature, the air, the water, the earth, uh, light. These, all, all these things have their natures, fire. And uh, that means that in some cases, uh, they're gonna cause suffering when those natures express themselves. Um, if God, um, this involves imposing constraints on God's own actions. If he's gonna create a world in which creatures have natures, then he has to allow those natures to act in accordance with, them, with their own dispositions and, and uh, inclinations. He can't simply change the way things act in a, uh, case by case basis, right? He has, to, he has to allow the creation to unfold. And that means that any divine intervention has to be the exception rather than the rule. He can't, he can't step in and, and let fire do its thing when it's helpful and stop it when it's harmful, or water when it's helpful and stop it when it's harmful. Uh, that would mean that there would be no water, really. 
right? He would be destroying the nature of those things. And likewise, he can't step in and make human beings uh, always act lovingly and never hate, hate, hatefully if, uh, if it's their nature to act in the contrary way. So that leads then to a third question then. Are, uh, so, so am I saying that miracles are impossible? So am I saying God created a certain world, he built it with natures in it, and then he just stepped back and let it run, right? He did nothing whatsoever after that. Uh, this, is, this is kind of what in English we sometimes call deism, the idea that God um, was the clockmaker. He built this great clock at the very beginning, and then he just let it run. He doesn't intervene with it, in, inside it. And uh, my answer there is no, that's not right. That's, that's an inconclu incorrect conclusion to draw. Uh, divine miracles are possible, but only when they have some kind of special justification. Uh, usually as part of the history of revelation, and not just for the sake of preventing pain or suffering to creatures. Right? So if, you know, if, if God intervened whenever there was pain or suffering that was involved, that would mean that he was intervening almost all the time. And that would, that would really destroy creation, it would mean that creation couldn't exist. But if he intervenes only in very special cases, and we see in the Bible that the miracles tend to be clustered around crucial events like well, like the, I, I, the picture I had here a minute ago with uh, Moses and uh, splitting the Red Sea and the, when the uh, people of Israel left Egypt, or around the prophet Elijah, or especially in the case of Jesus and his apostles. So there were miracles that occurred in, in special cases, but, um, but they always had to have some sort of special justification. All right, so then fourth question is, um, so, so am, I, am I saying that human suffering and death are just good things, really. They're just part of the cycle of life. God created a world. He created us with a certain nature, human nature. That human nature includes the fact that we suffer and are sick and are injured and eventually die. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's all just a part of, of the creation that he made. And so we should kind of get over it, right? Uh, recognize these things are not bad at all, but good. Uh, well, no, I'm not saying that, actually. Um, because, again, from the Christian point of view, uh, God did not intend for human beings to be subject to illness, suffering, or death. As God created human beings originally, in the story in Genesis, we, we hear that he puts us, put the original human beings in a garden, so-called Garden of Eden. Uh, and in that situation, human beings were meant to be immune from illness, suffering, injury, and death. So they were, I think, quite different from the rest of creation. They were intended to be, um, he intended for us to have a different sort of life where, where, our, um, where we'd have, we would have control over our bodies and our environments in such a way that we wouldn't suffer those things. So what happened? Well, human beings the very, from the very beginning uh, rebelled against God. They misused their free will and chose to, um, to, re to reject God's role as their uh, as their lord or as their uh, master, and to become their own their own god in a sense, and that almost immediately led to all kinds of moral evil, where they started intending to hurt each other and to harm each other and, and, and be unjust to each other. We get early stories about uh, about murder and, and so on, and so at that point, God uh, pushed humanity out of that garden situation. Uh, they he made us subject to suffering, death, disease, and so on, ultimately I say death, uh, because that was really the lesser of two evils. If God had allowed us to be morally and spiritually evil and rebellious, but uh, didn't give us death, then that moral evil on the part of human beings would just go on forever. And you, just, you could just imagine, you know, if the Nazis had been able to, to uh, uh, persecute uh, others forever with no end, uh, that would be far worse. So death is actually a necessary evil because it brings a limit to human, human wickedness, basically. And along with death comes suffering and disease and all the rest. So, so these things are part of our lives now, but they weren't part of the original creation, according to Christian theology. And that's, that's an important point, because it means that uh, we can recognize that human death and suffering really are evil. They're not, they're not part of God's uh, intended creation. Now, um, fifth question would be, well, okay, fine, but then why did God place us in the midst of such a fallen, corrupted creation, right? I mean, I didn't 
I was never in some idyllic garden where I got to choose whether to follow God or not. I didn't rebel against God the way those early human beings did. Why am I stuck in this fallen creation where I'm subject to death and illness and suffering and so on? It doesn't seem fair, right? Why me? Um, well, the answer to this is, turns on a kind of subtle philosophical point, which is, well, what's, who exactly am I? What is, what is, what is, what's essential to me? And the question presupposes that I could have existed in a world where there was no rebellion and sin and suffering and death, right? Where I could have been uh, basically in the kind of situation that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And I think that's just not at all plausible, right? Um, I mean, who am I? I'm a person who was conceived at a certain time and place by particular people in a history, right? Uh, so I couldn't have existed, for instance, if the Korean War hadn't existed, for example, and if World War II hadn't happened. I mean, all that, all those events which led up to my, my conception and birth, those are sort of built into my, uh, my very identity, I think. It's no sense, I think, to ask why God didn't put us in a better world. Um, in other words, if he'd, made a, if he'd made a better world or a different world, uh, you and I wouldn't be in it. We, our identities are tied to this very world. And so uh, it's only, the only thing we can really ask is that if God loves us, he loves me, what has he done for me in this world, in the kind of world in which I exist? Not why didn't he put me in a different sort of world entirely? So we can ask, you know, given that humanity has fallen and that we're under this curse of death and suffering and so on, what has God done for me in that context, right? And, uh, and we'll see that he's done a lot. So it's, uh, it's quite remarkable, actually, all that he's done for us. Now, we could also ask, sixth, sixth question, why did God create us at all, knowing that many of us would, would suffer and turn to great evil, right? So when God created human, humanity, he knew that human beings were going to rebel. He could see the future. He knew that he would have to impose um, a, a penalty of death, a, a curse of death, in order as a necessary evil, given human human wickedness. He knew that that would result in all kinds of suffering and evil, you know, world wars, holocausts, and so on. So why do it at all? Why why get started on it? Why not just uh, not create anything? Certainly not create anything like us. Uh, knowing that it would turn out so badly. Well, I think this question, again, doesn't really make any sense. Um, the act of creation is something that God does, uh, which is completely unique. It's totally unlike any action that you and I could choose. You know, we're never going to sit down and say, hmm, should we create a whole world? And if so, what should, how should we do it? Um, I mean, it's, 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 a, uh, it's an action that's completely different from any human action. And so it doesn't really make sense for us to try to figure out why God did it, why or why he might not have done it. I mean, we just don't have the categories uh, to understand God's thinking here. Uh, we could, I should emphasize that God was under no prior obligation or relationships. So before he created the world, and as he's thinking about whether to create the world, there, there's no one else there. So there's no one there for him to love. There's no one there for him to be fair to or just to. Um, I mean, he's acting from a complete... A uh, place of, um, uh, of again, uh, isolation. It's just him, uh, the three persons of the Trinity. Uh, and he has to decide whether to create or not. And so, again, it's a context in which you and I can't even really begin to imagine. What we can really ask is how God's actions subsequent to, cre subsequent to creation display his goodness and loving kindness. So we can ask, okay, we don't understand why he created what he did, but given that he's created what he did, what has he done since then? What has he done in the context of that creation to show his goodness to us and his loving kindness? And so those are fair, fair questions, I think. Um, now, why didn't God create a better world? Why not create a world in which he would have creatures who couldn't, let's say, who, who couldn't or who, who wouldn't rebel? Creatures who would just always do the right thing and therefore would never, rational creatures, and therefore would never have to suffer, never have to die, no disease. Um, and no sin, no wickedness. Right? Couldn't he have done that? I mean, he might have. In fact, I think he did do that. So there's a whole world, you might say, of uh, creatures that in the Bible we call angels, the holy angels, uh, who uh, exist in, in a world of bliss and happiness and never sin and never experience any, any harm. Um, 
So he did create such a world. And the question is, why not create us as well in addition to that? Why not? What's wrong, what's wrong with it? Right? There's, no, there's no reason why you shouldn't. I mean, for all we know, God could have created an infinity of, of alternate worlds. There could be parallel universes out there in vast numbers or planets out there anyway, where there are lots and lots of creatures all happier and better than us. Um, and uh, that's really possible. And so the only question is, why not create us as well? It just makes the world a more varied place. I mean, as long as, as, long as our existence is not a net negative, as long as it's positive, it's better, than, better for us to exist than for us not to exist, there's no reason for God not to create us as well. Yeah. Now, um, this is a question I think that a lot of people have, the eighth question, is do the imperfections of this world reflect an imperfection in God? So I've been saying that in a certain sense, the world is an imperfect place, right? It's a place in which there's sin and wickedness, and as a result of that, there's death and suffering, and none of that's ideal in any sense. So it's an imperfect world, and it's created by God, so doesn't that make God an imperfect God? Doesn't the imperfection of the world reflect back on God? Uh, as you can guess, I'm going to say no. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's precisely because God is infinite in his perfection that we would expect a highly imperfect universe creation. So it's a little bit of a paradox, actually. If God were finite, you've got that in the slide. Um, if God were finite, you might expect him to create the best world he was capable of. So if God had just a certain amount of power, but it wasn't infinitely powerful then there'd be a certain kind of world which would be the best world that he could manage to create. And you might expect, well, that's what you would expect a, a good but finite creature to do the best he could. Right? But since God is infinitely powerful, infinite, there's no best possible world he could create. For any world that he could create, there's an infinite number of still better worlds that he could have created. And given that fact, it's actually not surprising that he would create a very imperfect world, right? because he can't create we can't say, why didn't you do your best, God? Because there's no such thing. He couldn't have done his best. There's, there's no best that, that an infinite creature, creator could do. And so, um, so it's not really surprising that we have an imperfect world. Uh, I've been working on this idea recently. This is somewhat, you might think it's somewhat irreverent here to compare God to a sloth and to say that in a sense, there's a kind of indolence of God. That is, um, that God doesn't act as often and as thoroughly as we might expect him to act. An infinite God can never do all the good he's capable of, right? Because he's capable of infinite good. So he can never do that, right? And so that means that God never needs a reason not to do something. He's always got an extremely good reason not to do it. Namely, he could always do better. So no matter what he does or doesn't do, he's always got good reasons not to do anything. And so you can't expect, you can't look at God and say, why didn't you do better? Why didn't you approve on this? Because, he, because that's just not the way God works, right? Uh, he just doesn't think that way. What, God's, you know, what God does do will always be good and often amazingly good. Right? I think I want to emphasize that. He's, he's innocent. Everything he does is good. And it's often amazingly good. But you can't look at it and say, well, why not better? That never makes sense for God because God is infinite. Um, we just have to accept this is what he's done and be happy with it, right? We can't, we can't ask him why he didn't do better. Now, what's our, if that's true, what's our response to this? Well, it actually makes sense for us to try to give God special reasons for, particular, for actualizing particular goods. So in other words, if, uh, if one of my children is sick, um, God's got some reason to, to heal him or her, but on the other hand, he doesn't need a reason not to heal. He, that's just the way he is, right? Uh, he, 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 there's no reason, there's no guarantee that, that he will do every possible good thing he could because he can't. So it does make sense for us to give God a special reason for doing particular goods. And this is uh, one reason, one avenue for this is what we call petitionary prayer. This is where we pray to God and ask God, please heal my child, let's say. Please take care of, of my, my mother. Uh, and such prayers actually do influence God's actions by giving him reason to do particular goods that are asked for. Right? So um, in, the, in the absence of prayer, of course, he has some reason to do these things, but he doesn't really need a reason not to do them. Uh, he, uh, he often will just not do good things for no reason whatsoever. And so praying will give him more reason to do those particular good things and can actually make a difference. 
in my opinion. But even then, there's no guarantee. I mean, we can't coerce God into action through our prayer. Uh, God, you know, God isn't going isn't to allow us to control him by just asking for anything we want to. I'd like a million dollars, God, please. Um, and in certain cases, God may have good reason not to answer our prayer. And so um, even though we pray very hard for something and lots of other people might pray for it, he still might say, decide to say no because he knows better in that particular case. So there's no, uh, there are no guarantees here. Some more consequences of this fact um, is since God is, is constrained to respect created natures, as I mentioned earlier, right? So he creates a world in which things have natures and he doesn't interfere with those natures on a uh, case by case basis, right? He usually allows them to, um, to, be, uh, uh, to do, do their own thing. And he's infinite. And therefore, he's indolent, as I've described it. That is, he often just won't do things that he could do for no particular reason. Uh, because of those two facts, it's often up to us to fight against suffering. So if there's suffering out there, if there's poverty, disease, unnecessary death, war, uh, it's often up to us to do something about it. We can't just uh, sit back and let God take care of it. Now, if we do act on, against these things, God will cooperate with and bless our efforts in many ways. We can't say exactly how, but, but he's, I'm confident that he will. He's promised that he will. And this solves a dilemma that was posed in Albert Camus' uh, famous novel, The Plague, which is very relevant today. Um, there's a priest in the, in the book who wonders, you know, how can he fight against the plague, given that God, it's obviously God's will that the plague should be there, right? And so how can he fight the plague without fighting God? And the answer is, well, we can fight the plague without fighting God because uh, the plague is not there because God wanted it to be. It's there because it's a consequence of the na natures of things that he created. And he's left it up to us to fight against that suffering. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not his job, so to speak, to eliminate all these evils because he's infinite. And if he eliminated all evils, we wouldn't have the world that we have in the first place. Um, now, in calling God indolent, I'm not saying that he hasn't done amazing things for us. I'm simply asking that we stop focusing on what God hasn't done and look instead at what God has done, right? We need to be grateful for all the good things that God showers on us every day, most of which we take for granted, our health, our life, our, our children, our families, our country, and, and so on, our, our chances for education. He showers many, many good things upon us all the time, which we take for granted. And in addition, from a Christian point of view, he's also taken the extraordinary step of assuming our human nature is becoming a particular man, Jesus of Nazareth, and then living and eventually dying in great shame and pain in order to overcome our separation from him. He had to do this in order to reveal to us that he loved us, and at the same time to reveal to us that we are uh, in rebellion against him that there's something fundamentally wrong about our present condition. In order to do that, he had to live this, live this particular kind of life. And again, that's an extraordinary step on God's part, something that you could hardly have expected God to do. And, uh, and so uh, we, we can be truly grateful in responding to, to what God has done for us. So finally, what positive meaning does suffering have for us? And going back to the, to the plague, Camus, the plague, I mean, one positive meaning that it can have for us is that, um, that we can fight against it. And to, again, step back to a step. We can see that God himself conquered evil through suffering, through the suffering of his son, Jesus, on the cross. So suffering has a positive meaning there. It's because Jesus suffered on the cross that he's able to uh, die on the cross, that he's able to reconcile us to God. And so that has a positive meaning. And we can participate in God's warfare with evil too through patiently enduring suffering ourselves and by acting compassionately. So when suffering comes into our lives or into the lives of other people around us, that's an opportunity for us to join in God's battle against evil. And in a sense, to identify with Jesus himself in his suffering on the cross. Uh, we, we become partners with, with, with Christ in, in that action. And then finally, it's important for us to realize that we can have a hope for eternal life if we accept this, this gift that God is offering us through Jesus Christ. 
we can, we can experience eternal life free from pain and suffering and death in which we and others can enjoy the fruits of our current struggles. So however bad the suffering is, there's, we can look forward to an infinite, an infinite eternal life in which we can enjoy the fact that we have overcome that suffering through patience, through compassion, through, uh, through faith. And so there's an overbalancing, uh, what, which Paul calls glory, I think in 2 Corinthians, kind of glory that we will enjoy for eternity uh, through uh, presently bearing the suffering patiently and using it as an opportunity to participate with Christ in his warfare against evil. So let me just close um, by turning to the arguments that atheists often use here to, uh, to argue that because there's evil, that is suffering and death and, and pain, that therefore there can't be a God, God can't exist. And it's called the Lucretian problem of evil because it goes back to an ancient Roman philosopher named Lucretius, who was the first one to kind of formulate this argument really clearly. So here's the argument. Um, first of all, if God exists, then God is wholly good and omnipotent and all powerful. And so that's just true by definition. If there's a God, then God would be perfectly good and perfectly powerful, all powerful. Uh, a perfectly good God, a holy good God would want to create or make actual the best possible world. He'd want the world, the creation to be in the best possible state it could be in. And the best possible state the world could be in would be a world without any bad things at all, with no death, no suffering, no pain. Right, that'd be the best possible world. But if God is all powerful, he can actualize any world. He can make actual any world he wants. So he would want to be, he would want the world to be the best possible world. The best possible world would have no evil in it, and he can make such a world. So therefore, there would, if there's a God, there would be no evil. But there is evil. Bad things exist, right? And therefore, God does not exist. So this argument is, um, it's logically valid, as we say in philosophy, that is, if all five premises are true, then the conclusion is also true, there's no God. Right? And um, I'm definitely going to agree with the first premise, if God exists, he's going to be wholly good and all powerful. That's, that's just true by definition. I'm not going to squabble with that. I mean, a being who wasn't perfectly good, or wasn't all powerful, wouldn't really count as God. And I'm certainly gonna agree with five, that bad things exist. I mean, some, some people try to resist this and say, well, maybe all of the evil, all the suffering and pain is just an illusion. But um, first of all, I don't really believe that. And secondly, even if it were true, it still would make five true because illusions are bad things, right? Uh, and, and if illusions exist, then evil exists. And so you, you haven't really escaped premise five, right? I mean, uh, nightmares are bad, even though everything that happens in a nightmare is an illusion. Still, nobody wants to have nightmares. So I think one and five, we just can't get away from. So the question is whether two, three, and four, these other three premises are, are correct. And uh, I would say, no, they're all probably wrong. So the middle three premises of the, of the argument are just false, probably false. And so the argument doesn't work. Uh, first of all, there's no such thing as the best possible world. This is what I was talking about earlier. God is infinite. So no matter what world he, could he would create, there would always be much better worlds he could have created, much better than that. There's no best possible world. And so God needs no reason to create a subpar or imperfect world. Any world he creates would be imperfect, would be subpar. And so the premise two is just wrong. A holy good God doesn't want to create the best possible world because there's no such thing. It doesn't even make sense. Um, thirdly, going back to the third premise here, let me just go back to that for a second. Um, the best possible world would be a world without any bad things in it at all. Well, that's not obviously true, right? I mean, maybe God created some worlds within our world in which there's no evil and no suffering and other worlds where there is some evil and suffering. And why not, uh, why not make more rather than less, right? Why not, uh, as long as our world is better than, 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 it's better that our world exists than that it doesn't exist at all. Uh, a certain amount of evil isn't uh, obviously uh, a detraction from, from the goodness of the world around us. And finally, there are some things that even an all-powerful God can't do. So for instance, he can't control the free will of rational creatures. He can't give us our free will and then make us act a certain way. And he also, this is true for inanimate things too. He can't create water and then make water act in an unwatery way all the time. That it wouldn't be water anymore if he did that. 
So there are certain constraints here, which even an all-powerful God has to respect. And, that, uh, that, and that's why premise four doesn't work either. Um, just to emphasize the point I've been making here, um, you know, God is infinite, we're finite. That's a really crucial thing to bear in mind. And God is good and we are good, right? Uh, when sometimes we're good, God is always good. But goodness has a different meaning in the two domains. It's just different for God to be good than for us to be good, right? I mean, God, you know, I love my child and if some terrible thing were happening to my child and I could prevent it, I would prevent it, right? God loves us and sometimes terrible things happen to us and he doesn't prevent it, what's going on? Well, it's because love in God is different from love in us because God is infinite and we're finite. So we can't, uh, we can't uh, assume that they have exactly the same meaning in a sense, operationally, right? Um, now when God's action is similar to ours, so when he makes promises or when he becomes a human being as in Jesus of Nazareth, then we can apply moral standards with confidence. So I'm confident that God will keep his promises because he's doing something that's similar to a human action, he's making a promise. And likewise, I can be confident that when Jesus becomes, when God becomes a human being in Jesus, that Jesus will act in a loving and good way because God is adopting the human mode of action. But when the actions are radically dissimilar, like when God creates the universe from nothingness, ex nihilo, as theologians say, there's just no comparison between that and us. And it doesn't make any sense for us to try to apply our moral standards to God's action there. We just have to say, okay, God did what he did. And it's really beyond our understanding. Okay, real quickly then, just to summarize what I've been saying, um, there are self-imposed constraints. God may have placed himself under fixed constraints, certain binding policies of non-interference. And that explains why he doesn't interfere more often because he's, he's, in order to create a world, he's had, he has had to bind himself in such a way to respect the nature of things. There's no best possible world given God's infinity. And that means he's necessarily indolent. There's always gonna be things he doesn't do for no reason, just because he's infinite and there's no best that he could do. And thirdly, there's, there's a matter of fragility of personal identity. If God had made a better world, then we wouldn't be in it, right? So God didn't show a lack of love for us by not making that better world, right? He loves us as individuals. He's not, he's, again, he's not in the business of just making a world with as much happiness as possible. He's in, he's in the business of loving particular individuals. And so that means loving us in the world that he did create, right? And apart from Jesus, I think that there is really no compelling evidence for God's love. So to really know that God loves us, we have to look at the event of Jesus and the way in which Jesus transposes God's character into a human key. So we can't really understand God, but, but when God becomes a man, we can understand the man and thereby understand God indirectly. And so Jesus and the love that Jesus shows to people around him, that's really crucial in understanding God's love. So finally, looking at our response, uh, as I said, human death and suffering are not part of God's original creation. And that means that we can fight against human death and suffering without, without opposing God's creation. Right? We're, not, we're not trying to uh, stop something that God created. We're trying to stop something that's the result of our own rebellion. Jesus' passion and death gives meaning to all suffering. Jesus became human to reach us in our wickedness. And this required him to suffer at our hands in order to reveal both our wickedness and his grace, his goodness. So um, by, bearing patience, by bearing suffering patiently and by working to relieve the suffering of others, we can unite ourselves with Jesus' sacrifice. And so again, that gives meaning to suffering in our lives. And we look forward to an eternal world in which the struggles, these struggles will be rewarded by an unimaginably great surplus of, of glory, of, of goodness in the, in the eternal world. Okay, good. So that's, uh, that's the talk. And uh, let, me, uh, let me see if I can unshare that and get back to the, uh, to the pictures. So uh, yeah, Yanku, we're I'm ready for questions. Um, Thank you, Dr. Kunz. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry good. again about the <laughs> this yeah, was... unpleasant situation. And um, yeah, uh, next time we'll, we'll lock the room. I think after 10 minutes, so we will. Um, yeah. So the first question is, um, 
So everybody, if you have a question, please uh, send a question to me. Uh, and uh, this is the only way to, to um, ask a question to Dr. Kuhn. So the first question is, uh, Dr. Kunz, could you, uh, could, couldn't God have created a world in which free will exists, but no suffering? Um, I think he might have. Um, and, um, and there may indeed be realms of our world that are like that. As I mentioned, the, uh, the, the holy angels uh, have free will and uh, they didn't uh, misuse it and they didn't experience any kind of suffering. Uh, there might be other planets or other parallel universes where that has happened uh, to creatures more like us even. Uh, so it's quite possible. Um, question is, you know, is there any reason why he shouldn't also create human beings, uh, giving us free will, knowing that we would misuse that free will? And I can't see any reason why he shouldn't do that as well. Great, thank you. Uh, would you pray that God will stop uh, uh, flooding? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I would, I pray about almost everything. Right? <laughs> so, uh, right, so any kind of uh, suffering, evil, uh, death, unnecessary death, um, is something that I would uh, recommend we, we pray about. Um, we give God additional reason to uh, intervene in some cases, and even miraculously, sometimes you will. And uh, no reason why we shouldn't do that. Can you share a situation where you, you, one of your prayers was answered? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I've seen this in a lot of cases um, where um, someone at church is, uh, is in a really serious uh, health uh, medical emergency and uh, people prayed for them and they got and they recovered in, in ways that were quite remarkable. Right? I had a friend who had a really serious back uh, condition um, and um, the people prayed for it and it, it got better and the doctors couldn't really explain why. Um, and um, you know, it's, it, it's difficult of course to prove that these are miracles, but, but when they happen over and over again and uh, there's, there's a, a lack of a good explanation, then I think it's, it's reasonable for us to, at least I think it's reasonable for a, a someone who believes in God to think that uh, some of these are, are, are due to miracles. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kunz. You know, when you talk, you, you, you sound very, very confident. And I, I, I believe you are, but there is, <laughs> uh, I think, do you have the, in your faith life moments when you doubt, uh, when there were doubts in your, in your, in your life or uh, regarding what you believe? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a whole spectrum, right? I mean, certainly when I was younger, um, I would have a lot of doubts even about the existence of God. I think I've gotten to the point now where I don't really doubt that much. That seems pretty obvious to me. Um, and uh, really, the, the reality of Jesus as, as my Savior, as the Son of God, that also seems to me to be beyond any reasonable doubt at this point in my life. But, you know, I doubt about more specific things about, you know, which particular church should I belong to, for instance, that's a, that can be a hard one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question here. Um, what is your take on nihilism? And do you believe today society is more nihilistic than before? So there are two questions. Yes, right, yeah. I'm not sure I know exactly what nihilism means. Um, I, mean, I guess it, it's the idea that nothing is of any real value, and um, and they, maybe that uh, that the idea that there's that there's things that are good or bad is just an illusion, I suppose. Um, and I, I, I don't. I mean, I don't find that a very attractive viewpoint. I mean, it seems to me is it's obvious that certain things are really good. Um, friendship is really good. Love is good. Um, knowledge is good. These things to me seem to be pretty obvious. Um, now, I do think it's probably true that in, in our day, world today, there is more uh, nihilism. And um, of course, as a, as a Christian, I can explain that by saying that, you know, if, if you detach good things from God, they, they don't have the same kind of value they would have otherwise, right? So, um, so you know, having a friendship that is that you see as flowing from 
God, right? Because God is love. That gives that friendship an added level of value and, and significance that it otherwise wouldn't have. And so if, if, if you're an atheist, right? And you, you just don't relate anything to God, then the, the things of this world can seem kind of insipid after a while. They don't really satisfy, right? Um, and uh, because our, our hearts and minds have been made for God to have to seek union with God. Now, I'm not saying that that means that the only thing that matters is God and that there aren't other good things, right? I mean, you know, even a good, a good dinner, a good cup of coffee, right? Those are good, but they're even better when you see them as somehow flowing from God's nature and as something that God is sharing with us and, and using to reveal himself to us. Um, there's someone who um, says, I don't agree with the statement because God is inf infinite in perfection. He creates an imperfect world. Does the Bible yeah. support this statement? Well, I don't know that the Bible says that, but well, I, I, mean, I think it probably does, right? I mean, I think you could, you could, you could look at a lot of the passages in, um, in the Psalms and in Isaiah, um, you know, that sort of emphasize the fact that, that God is perfect and, you know, we're not, right? That, um, that we are always going to... Dr. Kunz, so, so uh, God is perfect, we are not, but the, yeah. is it true that he created an imperfect world or it was created perfect and then something happened? Yeah, right. I mean, uh, it, I, guess, I guess it depends on what you mean by perfect. So um, in, the sense, in, in the sense that you know, everything is, is less, less good than it could be, right? So, you know, go, let's go back to before human beings sinned, right, in the Garden of Eden. So God's created this world, and God says it's good, right, in Genesis 1. He says it's very good, the end of Genesis 1. So I'm not denying that. It is a very good world. I would definitely affirm that, especially before human sin came on the scene. But he didn't say it's just as perfect as I am. Right, uh, he didn't say that, and I think uh, you know the moon. The moon is beautiful, but could God have created a more beautiful moon than our actual moon? I think he could have. Right, uh, right. I mean, uh, the flowers are lovely. A rose is beautiful, and so on. But could he create a flower more beautiful than any flower that actually exists in our world? Yeah, I think he could have. So, in a sense, you know, although it's a very good world, it's not the perfect world. There's no such thing, right? Uh, any world that God creates is going to fall short of absolute perfection, uh, and that and that's true even even prior to humans messing it up. Now, of course, it's true that human sin, wickedness, has made a mess of what had been a very good world, right? Uh, and uh, and and that's and that's the result of again human wickedness. Um, you know, could God have created human beings in such a way that they wouldn't have sinned? You know, maybe, maybe he even did something like that in other worlds. Uh, and again, the angels, some of the angels seem to be in that kind of situation. Um, but um, the crucial thing I'm saying is that, you know, did God show a lack of love to me and to you by creating human beings in such a way that we might sin? I say no, because if, if human beings had never sinned, he would made us in some completely different form, like angels, uh, well, then, then that would be a world that wouldn't include me or you, right? Because, I mean, our identities are tied to this kind of world. So the question is um, not could God have created a better world, but what has God done for me in this world, right, to show that he loves me? That, that, that's the question we need to ask, um, I think. And yeah, the answer is he's done a lot. He's done a lot for us. Right? He's done a lot. Yeah. So he created the not a perfect world, but a good world. And yeah. the um, the idea is not that uh, you know. And he he he's proof of love that he, you know, he's doing a lot of things for us. And the ultimate good thing is that he sent his son for for us uh, to die, and so we can uh, we can have eternal life, and not only eternal life. Uh, many, many questions. Uh, how yeah. can we call it free will, knowing that we are watched by, a, uh, an, by a, an almighty force ready to pay us for the evil we are doing? Being watched all the time does not express uh, liberty, but constraints. Mm 
Mm. Yeah. So how can we call it free will? If yeah. God is watching us all the time. And... Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, if it were really, really obvious all the time that God is watching us, then it might really be impossible for us to be free, completely free. Right? So in other words, if, if every time I acted, I could see God's eye kind of looking at me or something, or his face kind of glaring down at me, uh, then, uh, yeah, then it might really be impossible for at least creatures like us to be free. I mean, maybe other kind of creatures could deal with that, but it would be difficult for us. And so this is one of the reasons why God um, sort of creates a veil between himself and us. So that at least in this life, we aren't really, uh, we aren't able to see God directly in that way. And so though God sees us, we don't see him seeing us, right? And so that's why it's quite possible for us to forget about God, right? I mean, I believe that God is watching me all the time. And yet, you know, 90% of the time I forget that, right? And I just do things, uh, I'm not really aware that God is watching me. And so it's in that, that, that because of that, that distance, in, in philosophy, sometimes we call it an epistemic distance, that is uh, a distance in terms of knowledge, that we don't see God directly. We aren't, we're not aware of God all the time. That does create a kind of space within which we can be free. Um, now, once, once we get to heaven, of course, I think we'll still be free, even though we will be aware of God's um, more directly. We'll be able to see God directly. Uh, but in that case, um, so there's another, I guess this is sort of a two-part answer, right? Uh, in that case, it seems to me that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll want to do what God wants us to do. And so uh, we'll have made those significant choices already. We'll have decided that we were going to throw our lot in with God. And so, uh, so the fact that we're able to do it in his presence will not be, will not be inhibiting our freedom at all. Yeah, deep, uh, deep, uh, deep answer. Um, Dr. Kunz, you yeah, know it's, a hard, it's a hard question. It's, not, it's one of the harder questions, actually, I have to admit. Yeah, uh, it is. Um, you know, everybody has a worldview, even though they, they say they, they don't. Uh, in your yeah. opinion, um, how does Christianity uh, um, better answer the problem of suffering uh, than uh, Buddhism, <laughs> for example, or uh, the nat naturalistic view? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good question. Um, let's see. So, in the in the in the case of Buddhism, um, I mean, there's a, there's some overlap here, I think, right? In that in that uh, Buddhism and Christianity both agree that that suffering is bad, right? Uh, but there's a, a different diagnosis of what's going on because the Buddhists think that that the root cause of suffering is desire. So, if you could just extinguish all desire then the suffering would go away. And Christianity, I think, says, no, in fact, desire is good, right? Uh, in fact, uh, we should desire more than we do, than, uh, rather than less. Uh, we, ultimately, we should desire God himself. We should desire union with God. And so, um, and so it's quite a, different, quite a different picture there, I think. And uh, I, th I think that the Christian picture offers a more hopeful answer, in a way, right? I mean, the Buddha says, you know, here's the way to avoid suffering. Just don't want anything. And the Christian says, no, keep on wanting things and your, your desires can actually be fulfilled in, in, in union with God. So if, you know, if the Christian answer is correct, that's a much more hopeful answer, I think, than the Buddhist can offer. And similarly, you know, it's more hopeful certainly than the naturalist can offer. The naturalist um, can say, you know, maybe technology will someday eliminate the suffering. And, you know, some people think we can maybe even live forever through technology. But um, it's not a very attractive option when you start thinking about it. You know, what would it be like to be, I don't know, a brain in a, in a vat, you know, sustained forever by some techn technology of the future? Um, I mean, as opposed to the Christian picture, which is that the uh, kind of eternal life that we're offering, that's being offered to us by God, is, is radically different from anything we've experienced here because it'll give it, it'll, it'll, it'll involve are having a kind of union with God, seeing God and knowing God in a deeper way. And, uh, and that will, um, um, yeah, it just, it, it, it gives a certain kind of meaning to, to our suffering here that, uh, that naturalism can't provide. 
uh, uh, I, I don't follow with the, with the question. There are so many. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, another thing we say about naturalism is, of course, it's, it's difficult for naturalism to explain moral evil sometimes. I mean, it looks as though, you know, again, violence, oppression, rape, and so on. Uh, from a naturalistic point of view, those seem to be just part of human nature. So why are they so bad? And the Christian again could say, well, it's only because our nature has fallen, only because we've been corrupted by, by human wickedness. Um, Dr. Kunz, knowing that God knows everything, I tend to say uh, that he expects humans to, to behave or act in, in specific ways um, or that he already knows how the humans act, will act. Am I assuming things right? If I'm assuming this correctly, how is it free will explained in the situation of Eve's disobedience, for instance? I am interested to understand better the issue of free will versus destiny. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, okay, so that's another hard problem. <laughs> I need another hour to, to even begin to tackle that one. <laughs> um, but I'll try, to, I'll try to say as simply as I can. So I do believe that God uh, sees everything, and I believe that he sees the future as well. So he knows, he knows what we will do in the future. But, um, but he does so in a way that doesn't, control what we do in the future. Um, and there's a Roman philosopher, a Christian philosopher named Boethius, who wrote about this book, book called The Consolation of Philosophy, which I recommend that you look at actually, if, if you're interested in this question. And he gives the analogy of watching a chariot race, right? And uh, so you, you're watching the chariot race and maybe you see one chariot pass another chariot at a certain point, right? Well, the spectator isn't making the chariot go faster, right? He's just watching it go faster. And in a similar way, God sees what I will do in the future. He isn't making me do the thing in the future. He just sees what I will do in the future, right? So it's still, I'm still just as free in the future as I am now, uh, even though God knows in both cases what I'm doing, right? So God is sort of outside of time, right? It's the picture here. He's kind of seeing time spread, spread out in front of him. And he sees things happening in the future as if they were happening right now. And just as you don't make something happen when you watch it right now, God isn't making something happen in the future by seeing it happen right now, so to speak, in his presence. So in the, in the same idea, I think you answer, but um, just want to uh, ask the question, what about predestination? What about Judah's case? Uh, he had free will when he did everything yeah. uh, betraying Jesus. Yes, right. No, those are pretty tough cases, I think. I know, uh, I know. And uh, yeah, so um, uh, I think that, um, that Judas did have free will, at least up to a point. I mean, if, there may, you know, if, you make, if you consistently make choices of a certain kind, you, you fix features of your character in such a way that it's almost impossible for you to change. Sometimes it is just impossible right, to change. And uh, so, you know, Judas could have made some, some choices early on such that by the time he gets down to actually betraying Jesus, it wasn't really an option for him not to do so. And so, um, and so God could, could sort of see that that, was, that that was happening, right? But Judas was still responsible because he made the earlier choices that made the later choice inevitable, right? So, um, so you know, we, we do sometimes find ourselves in that kind of situation. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's admittedly kind of a difficult question, especially if you, if you take seriously the idea that in the Old Testament already, you know, which, which prophet it was, um, Zechariah, Malachi, you might, uh, anyway, one of, the, one of the Old Testament prophets seemed to predict that one of the Messiah's followers would betray him. So that, that would have been you know, hundreds of years in advance. Um, and um, I, mean, I could give the same sort of answer. I could say, well, God just saw what Judas was going to do in the future. But um, it's not the complete answer because uh, you still have to figure out how he was able to fit that into a plan, right? In which, uh, in which Jesus does get betrayed. So um, when people are doing um, certain actions, they, they put themselves on a certain path. Uh, That's right. Uh, so yeah. It's like, it's like um, going back to Lord of the Rings, uh, it's like uh, um, Smeagol or it's mm -hmm. a bad analogy, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, certainly the, you know, the orcs have, have gone so far, right? There's really no, no, no hope for them to, 
to repent or, or change. Uh, and that does happen to human beings. You know, we can get to a point where we've, where we've exhausted our uh, opportunities for freedom. Yeah, uh, well, you know, it, but the thing, we, we saw um, uh, bad people. And when, when you look at the life of Paul, he, he did, a, he did a, some certain yeah. uh, actions, you know, killing and putting people in jail. But, you know, by the intervention yeah. of God, um, his life completely changed. Uh, so that's right. That's right. No, that's right. And we should, I should never judge about another person that they're too far gone. I, I, that's something that none, none of us could ever know. Yeah. Uh, why did God put that veil when he could have just let it that way from the beginning so we wouldn't, we wouldn't have sinned anymore? Yeah. I mean, um, it's possible. And maybe, maybe there are even creatures that are like that, right? where God just creates them and immediately they see God and they don't sin and that, that's that. Um, well, that's, that's just a very different kind of story from the story of humanity, right? And God's, God's put us on a different path. Hmm. Uh, question is whether there's anything wrong with this other path. I think, no, it's a really an interesting, interesting path, right? Uh, it makes possible the kinds of things that couldn't have been possible otherwise. And if I ask, well, but if God loved me, he should have made me like that. He should have made me such that you know, I was created, immediately saw God. But that's just impossible, I think. It wouldn't have been me. It would have been some other creature. Because my identity is tied with being a human being. And that's tied, indeed, it's tied with being part of a certain human story that includes Adam and Eve and the fall and all of that. So, uh, so it's, not, it's not a lack of love for me that he created me in this kind of world. Uh, but uh, a question or a statement, but Lucifer has seen God and he's, he's still sinned. Lucifer, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, it may be that he didn't actually see God, not, not in the sense we're talking about. Um, so uh, at least the, the medieval philosophers thought that, that the, Lucifer and the other evil angels sinned at the very moment of their creation uh, before they could actually enjoy the, the vision of God. Um, yeah, these are very, very tough questions. So, yeah, um, that's pretty speculative. Yeah, we don't know exactly how angels work. <laughs> yeah. um, are, are Christianity values making us weak? Uh, I know it's not the, on the topic, but turning gather cheek obedience, renouncing our idea of wealth. I don't know yeah. if that's in the Bible, but um, sometimes you have to lose by being a Christian. Sometimes, not all the time. So, um, yeah. And yeah, so that's a big question again. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, um, there's some truth to that concern, I think that is, um, uh, I think some, some Christians have interpreted, you know, turning the other cheek in such a way that, um, you know, that even whole nations can't defend themselves, let's say against invaders. And that's not, that's not been the mainstream of Christian thought. I think most Christians have thought that, uh, that really what Jesus is talking about there is when someone is attacking me for my Christian faith. And that in that kind of context, it's really important for me not to react uh, um, angrily against that, but just to, to accept it as, as an opportunity to witness to my faith. But I don't think he's saying that, um, you know, that, that we have to be pacifists necessarily, that we can't that we can't, uh, you know, arm ourselves as a nation to defend ourselves against uh, an aggressor. I don't think I don't think he's saying that at all. Um, I'm not saying that the, you know, Paul says um, that in Romans 13 that the government is God's minister for justice, and so uh, most Christians have thought it's okay to participate in the police and the just judicial system and to capture and punish criminals and all of that. So, so it's not it's not a um, uh, I think a recipe for um, complete inaction and weakness and passivity in the face of evil. I think that's a misunderstanding. Dr. Kohn's uh, one, one more question and um, then you know we will close. What are some of the books uh, you recommend for someone who wants to further explore this topic? Yeah, good. So, um, so the, the Consolation of Philosophy I mentioned by Boethius is, I think, a real good one on the 
questions that came up in the discussion about uh, free will and foreknowledge. That's, that's, those are some good, some good uh, books on that, on that score. Um, there's um, uh, some uh, important work been done by an uh, American philosopher named Alvin Plantinga. Uh, he's got one called uh, Warranted Christian Belief. Um, and he also had an earlier, much shorter book called God, Freedom, and Evil, where he lays out his uh, defense of the uh, importance of free will in making sense of these things. And um, I mean, there's a, they're a bit harder to find, but I like the work of uh, an English theologian named Austin Farrer, F-A-R-R-E-R. -R -E -R. Um, and uh, he, got, he had one called Love Almighty and Ills Unlimited, I really like. Um, so it's impossible. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kronz. Um, well, again, thank you everybody for being tonight. I'm sorry for what happened. Uh, um, Dr. Kronz, we will um, want to have you again with some other topics. And again, we, we will have you actually speak on the, uh, on the topic of God and Lord of the Rings. We'll, um, your, perspective, yeah. your perspective of um, God in Lord of the Rings. Right. So uh, and... if you have w one more uh, thought, one more idea that you can share with everybody now at the end, uh, be my guest. Yeah, no, I think I think we've covered things pretty well. Uh, you know, just uh, I guess the main message I want to get across is that um, we shouldn't we shouldn't be asking why God didn't make a better world, but rather how God has shown His love for us in this world, in the kind of world that He has created. I think that helps reframe the question. <laughs>